This evening, we are coming so close to the finishing of the Bible in a year, um, which, again, I think we've enjoyed it. Uh, I, have, I, I, I have enjoyed it personally, but I must admit, I haven't enjoyed it as much for Thursday nights, and just to be honest, because it's so predictable. <laughs> and I like to kind of move with what's happening in culture and what's happening in our lives during the year. But we've kind of been like set on what we've been doing this whole year. So it's been good. Um, I think a lot of us have enjoyed it, but I'm looking forward to finishing uh, the entirety of the Bible in the coming weeks ahead and uh, doing some new things this next year that I'm really excited to begin to roll out with you um, coming uh, after probably starting after the first Thursday of January. So it's been good. It's been a good opportunity to go through scripture together and, and take that time. I think each and every year we should do that. We will be promoting another Bible in the year plan for all of us this coming 2022, but we will not be doing it from the front as we have been um, in these consecutive Thursday nights. All that to say though, I can't believe we're already in December. Can you, be, can you believe it's December? On so many levels, I cannot believe it. Can you believe it's so cold outside? I cannot believe how cold it is outside. Can you believe how quick it gets dark? Have I talked about that enough? I cannot believe how fast it gets dark. <laughs> uh, this is the time of year. That's, it's, in, it's an interesting time of year. <laughs> but um, of course, we're coming to the close of the year. And so this is the time we're reflecting on what's happened during this year. And we will be having a service the last Thursday night of December will be just before Christmas, just before New Year's Eve. And so we'll be doing a special reflection time on the year for all of you. This evening, my challenge is to, I thought I could do a couple things. Uh, this evening, I thought, let me just pick a set of scriptures out out of one of the many letters you've been reading this week. Uh, this week, you would have been reading go, reading, go Eat Pork Chops. Do you know this? Go Eat Pork Chops. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Come on. Come on, church. That's the only four books in order that I know because the acronym Go Eat Pork Chops. Anyways, you've read Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, and part of First Thessalonians. During this week, you'll be doing that. So I thought, okay, let me, I could just pull out one section of scripture and talk about it with all of you. But I thought instead, these four letters in particular, and particularly Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, have had scriptures in them that have really shaped my life, especially over the last 20 some odd years. And I thought, you know, instead of just pulling out a section of scripture and um, kind of working through that scripture together, I'm actually just going to go through the kind of key verses that have kind of shaped my life over the f these four different books. And it won't go very long, I promise you. Some of you are going, oh my gosh, we're gonna be here all night long now. No, it won't go long. Like every Thursday night, I get up and tell Mark and say, hey, I'm probably gonna go a little short tonight. I've been saying that for four years. I've never gone short once. But this one might go, I might go short with this one. But every time I say that, probably not. I will say this, just so you can be patient with me tonight. Uh, I got an eye exam today and I found out that one of my eyes, my left eye got significantly worse during the last year. And my brain is so smart that what it had done over the last year is it actually started using my stronger eye to see farther away and my other eye to see up close to read. I don't know what the bio thing, I don't know what it is. So it did this for me. So today, about two hours ago, they corrected my vision for far away. I'm like, I can see all of your faces. It's a, you are such beautiful people, back row. I, I didn't know I was not able to see as well. I had already been wearing contacts, but it got progressively worse over the last two years. Well, when they fixed my eyes, I came to my office tonight, and I'm like, I can see everything. Where's the words on the pages? Where's the words? So it's, it's a little funky for me. So just be gracious with me. I got to work through this the next 24 hours, see if my eyes adjust. Maybe you've had this happen. I don't really understand it, but my doctor said, it's gonna be okay, Matt. Just go out there and try to read like you did before. And I'm trying and it's hard. But anyways, so bear with me this evening as we briefly cover some scripture verses if I might mess up reading them. Because of course, they will not be on the screen. My hope is that you have your Bibles with you this evening. So if you have your Bibles, open to the letter of Galatians. And we will be working through some of the history of Galatians Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, and then pulling out some key verses, and I'll share some thoughts on those. And it will make sense when we come to the conclusion. Galatians. Galatians is a very interesting book in that Galatians is written to the area of Galatia, which is a part of Asia Minor, but it's not a specific city. 
the area of Galatia is not a specific um, town. It's not a specific community. We just know that Paul is writing to the general area of Galatia. It's confused a lot of people and scholars for a lot of years trying to figure out why would he write to a general area? Was there a reason why he didn't address it to someone specifically? Was there a reason why he didn't write it to specific leaders in a specific community? But alas, we don't know the answer to that. We know that Galatia was an interesting area. In fact, Galatia um, was known in its history to, interestingly enough, have woman warriors, which is fascinating, kind of like um, the handmaids of Norway, the Vikings, that would, women that would carry shields. Uh, they say that there were women in the area of Galatia back then, that it was known as a very strong area. Uh, but we don't know much more than that. Yet, we do know from reading the letter to the area of Galatia, they were dealing with a group of people that were super fanatical when it came to Judaism. And this was very common in Paul's early ministry. Uh, Paul obviously came in some respects as now a reformer of the Jewish faith, saying all of this is true, but the Messiah has come to fulfill all of this. This is the new reformed way of being a Jew, and it's not just for the Jew, it's also a Gentile. And in doing so, he told people, Christ fulfilled all the doing so that you could just be a child of God and have everything of the glory of God from the most holy place in the temple. You get to have that dwelling inside of you. That was an extremely radical idea in the first century world for the first century Jewish mind because they knew that they had laws to follow. There were checks and balances. There are ways to worship God. There were only certain ways to talk about God. In fact, not even audibly using your voice to speak of him out of reverence and holiness. And then this guy, Jesus comes and says, I'm your friend, I'm your father, I'm your, your brother or sister. It was, it was a very um, wild idea. In many ways, very freeing idea for them. So the Jews that got a hold of Jesus found such freedom having the depth of Judaism now being fulfilled in Christ and now the freedom to go, I get to be so relationally close to that God who's been seemingly so big and far away. He's actually here in a person. He came to love me. I can love him and I have that personal relationship. That was an amazing idea, but not all Jews liked that idea because it was dangerous because it threatened everything that they built religiously. So when Paul started going around and preaching the gospel and sharing it to Jews, and not only that, to Gentiles, non-Jews, and Jews and Gentiles both start believing in Jesus, a group known as the Judaizers kind of rose up in the Jewish faith. And these Judaizers were individuals who were like Pharisees, but on steroids. And they would literally follow Paul town to town, city to city, doing everything they could to overturn the new movement and say, you can believe in Jesus, sure. That Paul taught, sure, you can believe in all that. But if you're Gentiles, you now have to be circumcised to really believe it. But if you're Jews, you have to really observe all the laws if you really believe it. So they weren't even coming at Paul and saying, he's a heretic. They were building off of it and adding, they were trying to add the whole religious side to it as well. So this group followed Paul around everywhere. It was like his heckling crowd. It was his peanut gallery. In almost every letter, he has different references where he's referring to these Judaizers in different ways, kind of calling them out and what they're trying to do to the new community that he's planted there. So in the area of Galatia, Paul writes this letter to them to say, you need to understand that you do not need to go back to the way things were because there's a whole new life for you to live. And Paul eloquently in this closing parts of his letter kind of sums up his whole letter in Galatians chapter five in verse one. And this is what he says. He said, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Other translations, you might have it. I like the way the NRSV puts it. It says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Now, when we read that, we go, of course, yeah, I, I, I know I'm free. And I know that I've accepted Jesus in my life. 
But then we have this like overbearing moral code sense inside of us that we begin to slowly start thinking that we have to do things to perform to actually have that freedom. Because all of us would feel that in and of ourselves, we're not good enough to receive that kind of freedom. And that's why Paul clarifies. He, he, he says, and that's why I like NRSV a little bit better in this translation. He goes, not so that you do something for him has he set you free. Not so that you're more kind to other people he has set you free. Not so that you give more money he has set you free. He says, for freedom alone, Christ has set you free. Just, just for freedom. Yeah, but no, yeah, but yeah, but I, I understand that, but, but I gotta do something. No, it's 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 simply for freedom. No, oh, no, there's nothing free in this world. We all know it. What's the hitch? No, 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 it's just for freedom. No, no, my mom used to say that to me. And then she started sending those passive aggressive texts about 10 days later. Nothing's for free. Paul's like, no, literally. For solely for freedom, you've been set free. Now, a lot of people struggle with this idea because they feel like, but Matt, I don't, I'm not comfortable being that free because what might I do to mess up my freedom? Well, I've learned in my life that when I'm the most free, I'm actually doing the best in all categories relationally with myself, in categories in relationship to my family, with my friends. It's when I begin to strive that I begin to find frustrations and begin to act out in sinful behaviors and things around me. Uh, Let's take it on a very, 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 very shallow basis. The moment someone comes to me and tells me, Matt, I have a diet where you can drop 20 pounds in like four weeks. My initial reaction is, I will pay any amount of money to make that happen, okay? And then they come in and they say, okay, this is what you need to do. You need to only eat all these weird foods at only these certain times of the day. And as they begin to tell me all the things I can't do, it makes sense to a degree, but almost inevitably, it's like almost inevitably, the moment that I know the things that I can't eat, I start craving those very stinking things. And for whatever reason, the devil keeps bringing those same things that I'm not supposed to eat right in front of me every single second of every single day. So I've realized this, I can't diet, but when I've set some parameters or some framework like, hey bro, you don't eat to eat. You don't need to eat a family-sized bag of Doritos at 10 p.m. Like when I set some parameters and I'm free to eat whatever I want, I find that I'm more controlled in what I'm doing because I have the ability to choose what I want. And in that choice, I realize I already know inside myself I shouldn't do this stuff. I don't need someone to give me text messages every day of what I should and shouldn't be eating. I already know. And when I find when I found the most freedom, I usually find the most help. Paul's saying, for freedom, Christ has set you free from the law. There's no reason for you to pick up a yoke of slavery. There's no reason to pick up another set of laws that maybe someone else has made for you or someone else has created for you. There's there's no reason to act out in hyper-religious ways because we all know what that's going to do. It just sets you up to fail. Christ set you free solely for freedom, not asking anything from you. And we all know when someone gives us something and we truly sense that their gift to us is with nothing attached, we walk away and what do we think? How can I be even more generous back to them? In the same way, God has set us free because he knows how we're wired in the fullness of our freedom in him. He knows we'll give him so much more of our life. But he says, but That won't happen if you put yourself under some kind of law. That won't happen if you put yourself under some kind of rules. And that's why at our church here, we've we've been done our best over the years to never preach 16 steps to be a better Christian or never created 18 rule books of how you need to follow things. Or if you're gonna be a part of this accountability group, you gotta sign up for these 60 things you gotta do. We're so we do our best to turn from all that because we know that all that does is set us up to fail more. 
And all it is is another yoke of slavery that we put upon ourselves. And Christ gave his life, why? For freedom. That's it. Literally, that's it. I mean, it doesn't make sense. It seems incomprehensible that someone would do that. That's why he's God and we are not. For freedom, he has set you free, not for anything else. And with that freedom, we then find a new way to live. Now, in the letter to the church of Ephesus, Paul does get specific. And he says to the Christians in the city of Ephesus, you know, Ephesus became eventually a central city for the church. It was like a New York city for the church. It was a big city, influential city. We also know that it was a radically idolatrous city. Um, it was known as a synchristic city, meaning that it had multiple belief systems all existing, um, coexisting together in some form of peace and harmony. Um, we know that it was known for um, progressive ideology in its sexuality. We know that it was progressive in its understanding of belief systems. We know that at one point it was a port city, so it was centered for trade, but If you were to visit Ephesus now, you could see where the port once was, and now dozens of miles away the ocean is because that port eventually filled in with land, and they no longer could make their money by trade. So then they began to make their money by selling of idols because they had a great temple to Artemis in their city. So it was a trade route area by road, no longer by sea. And at the time of Paul and Timothy and others, it was a massive distribution city for all things Gentile religions. So it was a spiritual Disneyland in a lot of ways. It was a wild, wild city. One of the most progressive cities of the day. And Paul, we know, spent several years there publicly doing his best to debate with other um, religious leaders and the desire to show Christ supremeness over all other belief systems. It, it, It was a significant city and it was very driven by a desire to understand the mysteries of spirituality. So when you read Ephesus, you see him repeat this word mystery like more than a dozen times. Um, You see him talk all about spiritual stuff. In fact, this is the letter we get the whole idea of the spiritual warfare. He equates the different battle armor pieces to the spiritual armor we battle. And the reason why all these things are found in the book of the letter of Ephesus is because he's writing to people desiring an understanding of spirituality. And so he gets into the mix of all the mysteries within Christianity. And he, he pulls terms out of Greek belief systems and puts them in and shows how Christ is the fulfillment of those different terms. It's a, it's a brilliant book. It talks a lot about identity and all this other stuff. But alas, I'm only going to read one verse. Because in this book, there is a verse that has always stuck with me. And it is right in the first chapter. And it's as if this verse applies to that freedom because this is how I'm able to live in that freedom. Ephesians chapter one, verse 19. He says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. To believe in Jesus goes against the tide of everything that the world has taught you that reality is. Christ comes with an upside down kingdom. To be first, you have to be last. If someone smacks you, you turn the other cheek. If you die in this life, you only have a life to gain in eternal life. It is completely opposite of everything that the world says. And if you try to live this relationship and this life according to the way of Jesus and do that within your own power, you will struggle every moment of every day. Because God knew that for you to live in a growing relationship with him, that you wouldn't have a power within yourself, Paul says he's given you a new power to live this new life. That you're not meant to live this new life with your old power. You're not meant to live this new life of worshiping God and and desiring to hear from him and allowing him to shape your decisions and allow him to mold your relationships. If you try to live the way of Christ in your own power, you will burn out. That's religion. But 
The grace of Jesus is that in freedom that he calls you to live, he then gives you a new power to live this new relationship with him, to live this new way. And it, this verse has always stuck out to me because whenever I'm feeling myself, now 23 years in ministry, 24 years in ministry, whenever I start feeling myself burned out, I quickly recall this verse because I think, Matt, are you working on this in your power or are you working on this in the power that rose Christ from the dead? And then inevitably, every time when I start getting to the point of being tired, worn out, cranky, snappy, not liking things around me, it's because I've been working in my own power, not in the power of the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Paul's saying, you got to work in that power. You got to have that power. If you're gonna become that new creation, if you're gonna be transformed by the renewing of your mind, it's not gonna happen in the power you've had in yourself. It will only happen in the new power you have available, a power that literally raised the son of God from the dead and didn't stop there, brought him and seated him in the heavenly place next to his father. That power, that all-consuming, wondrous power is the power you need to order your life by. If you try to follow Christ in your own power, you will burn out. That's why there's a new power, the power of God. Philippians. Paul writes a letter to the church of Philippi. <clears throat> and the Phil Phil Philippian church is an interesting church because we know that Paul went to Philippi in a second missionary journey. Philippi would be considered part of Europe today. And we know that Philippi was the first church in what would be considered Europe today. And interestingly enough, if you read the story in Acts, Paul went to the, tried to go to the synagogue in Philippi, but there was no synagogue in the city of Philippi. So instead he went down to this river that's in Philippi, thinking that there'd be Jews, maybe ceremonially washing at that river. And he would go there and preach the story that the Messiah had come there. Well, of course, he gets there. There's no Jews, but there's one woman named Lydia. What we know about Lydia is she was probably a wealthy woman. She sold purple cloth. We know purple cloth in the ancient world was of high value. And Paul comes in. He says, well, here's, this is the one. So he preaches the gospel. Well, what happens? She gives her life to the Lord. She is the first European convert. And from what we can gather, it was her home that the first church in Europe was planted in. A woman, a Gentile woman, a businesswoman. Put that in your face, all you that don't think that women should have any leadership in the church and that are feeling that the Bible's sexist. It is not. <laughs> so Lydia becomes a foundational member of a growing church. You can actually go to the ancient city of Philippi today. Of course, they've built a bunch of stuff around it, but you can get a, a general understanding of what the river would have been like, where it actually was, and where this whole thing occurred. Eventually, this church grows and does pretty well. And of course, Paul writes probably one of his most eloquent, eloquent flows of logic on what Christmas is. Now, he doesn't call it Christmas. He doesn't relate back to the story of Mary and Joseph, but he gives a, an amazing perspective on what God did when he came in the form of a child to earth and what that did for us. And I, I, every, each and every Christmas, I reflect on this because <clears throat> to me, what I found in my life is there's one attribute in my life that I can track in my 43 years of existence. Anything good that's come out of my life in 43 years of existence typically always has this character trait tied to it. And I think it's because it's the character trait that Christ would want all of us to walk in, which is humility. And when I look at my life, humility is the counterculture to pride. And we know it's pride that brought the enemy of the spirit world down to this earth and broke apart and started all this chaos we're in. And so Paul says on Easter, look at the greatest attitude of Christ and that of humility. And what would it be for all of us now free in our relationship with him and now empowered by his spirit to walk with humility in our life. Philippians chapter two, starting in verse three. And again, I think it's only by the power of God that we can even do the things that Paul's calling the Philippian church to do. He says, don't be selfish. <laughs> Definitely need God's power for that one. Don't try to impress others. Definitely need the power of God for that one. 
Be humble, thinking of others better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. That's two verses of our whole Bible. And if the church woke up tomorrow and made that their motto, how radically different would culture be? (laughs) If every believer, when I say church, I don't mean organized religion. If believers that attend church all woke up tomorrow and said, you know what? I'm not going to be selfish. I'm not going to try to impress everyone. I'm going to walk in humility. I'm going to think of others better than myself. And I'm not going to look out only for my interests, but I'm going to take interest in others too. How might that change our cultural climate? What might that do today in America? We probably have a massive spiritual awakening. Verse five, he says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And this is his poetic recording of the theological understanding of Christmas. Though he was God, verse six, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. That's not just humility in the act of being kind. That's not just humility in choosing to be silent when you want to offer your critique of something. That's humility to the point of literally laying down your physical existence to the point that you're dying by everyone's judgment when it's completely incorrect. That's like the worst thing to happen. I mean, I just, I, you know, my heart breaks hearing stories of, uh, of, well, we all know that we need massive res- reform in our prison system. But it breaks my heart to hear stories of people who got imprisoned for 10, 20 years only to find out with new DNA studies now that they were never the one that it happened to. Now, of course, we get to watch the story of them coming out and we're so thankful that they came out, but how many were killed in states that had the death sentence and were innocent the entire time? Now, that was a misunderstanding. Imagine choosing to come down knowing that would happen willingly laying down your life. This is the kind of stuff that makes me go, how could I consider any other belief system? Is any other God in any other belief system willing to live this kind of life for me? They would want this kind of life from me, but how many were willing to live this kind of life for me? Buddha wrote brilliant statements wasn't concerned with giving his life for me. Muhammad had some really wild ideas, but there were some pretty decent conservative ideologies, never considered giving his life for me. The 300 million Hindu gods never considered giving their life for me. But Jesus, on Christmas Day, chose to come down to earth and let the very humans that would eventually kill him care for him. As vulnerable as a child, a helpless child with no capacity to care for itself, the creator of heaven and earth came in that form and said, would you care for me long enough so that I can do my father's business and then I'm gonna allow you to judge me and kill me, but I'm gonna willingly let you do it because then I'm going to do something for you you couldn't have done yourself. And I go, that's humility. And what I found in my life, reflecting on verses like this from Paul, is when I've chosen, it's not always, when I've chosen to walk in that attitude, it's produced more fruit in my life than anything else I've ever done. And so I always come back on Christmas. Matt, what are you walking in pride about that in this season you need to let go of? as Christ calls you to an attitude of humility. What do, you, what do you need to keep your mouth shut about? Because Christ calls you in an attitude of humility. What do you think you have rights to, Matt, that you have to lay down because Christ calls you to walk in an attitude of humility? And here's the deal. I get it wrong most of the time. 
But there's a power that I can tap into to help me get it right some of the times. And my hope is each day I learn to get it right maybe a little bit more, but ultimately I'll fully get to walk in the glory of what that attitude is when I get to be home with my father and we're all worshiping him. Colossians, almost done. The church of Colossae was an interesting church because at the church of Colossae, we have one letter to them, of course, Colossians, but we have another letter as well. And that letter is the letter of Philemon. How many of you have ever read the letter of Philemon? Philemon is one of the shortest books in the Bible, 26 verses. It's a a, a relational conflict over a guy named Onesimus. The quick story is Paul, as we know, is in house arrest. And that's where he's written the letters of Ephesians, Philippians, and now Colossians. Galatians was not written during his time. Galatians was written earlier. But Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians are all written while he's in a house imprisonment in Rome. You can read about in the end of the book of Acts. While he's there, he comes across a guy named Onesimus. Onesimus hangs out with him. Onesimus gets saved. Paul comes to find out Onesimus is a runaway slave. Paul finds out Onesimus is a runaway slave of his friend Philemon. So Paul writes a letter to Philemon and the church that meets in his house. That church is the church at Colossae. So Colossians and Philemon, if you go to the ending of each letter, you'll notice names are similar. That's because this community is in the city of Colossae. And Colossians has a a, a number of things that we could go through, but we're gonna kind of zone in on one that again is one that's one of my favorites. And that's in Colossians chapter three, starting in verse 22. Now I'm gonna read it and I'll have to give some historical understanding of it and then I'll tie it together. Colossians chapter three, verse 22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Now, initially you're like, what? (laughs) I thought we're supposed to set the slaves free. And he's telling them to be really good slaves. What? (laughs) Slavery was very different in the ancient world. At this time in society, 75% of the workforce was slaves. Slaves at this time were not just people who had to do hard work. That was actually the smaller number. The larger number in the Greco-Roman world, slaves were ship captains. Slaves were um, handymen. Slaves were even doctors. Um, Slaves could be nannies. And you would willingly sell yourself into slavery on a contract, usually up to seven years, and that contract would be renewable depending upon your conditions of working. Slavery in the Greco-Roman world primarily was a form of working. It wasn't what we think of in our wounds in America and what happened with slaves here. But, of course, with anything, there's always a percentage of hardship, a percentage of bad stuff that goes down, a percentage of terrible things and harsh working conditions. And we know that according to Roman law, if you were a slave and you ran away as a slave, then if you were caught, you were liable in the court of Roman law to pay your slave, your master back for every day that he lost of profits with your being gone. Not only that, if someone harbored you as a slave, a runaway slave, that person would also have to pay that person a lot of money back. And this is what's so fascinating about the letter of Philemon, because Philemon was a runaway slave. Whose home was he hanging out with? A guy named Paul. And Paul's writing a letter for Philemon to receive Onesimus back and essentially say, would you not charge him for the time that he was gone? Long cultural story there. But here, what Paul's encouraging the slaves to do is to see their work as worship to the king. He's saying, you have seen your work as something you've wanted to not do. You've seen your work as a necessary evil. Paul's saying, you need to see your work as something that brings glory to God. In fact, he goes, let me take it a step further. Work for your master as if your master is Jesus himself. How might you work different if you're working knowing Jesus was your boss versus working for a guy named Philemon? In many ways, Paul, in this very brief two-verse idea, 
is giving us an understanding of what our role is when we go to work. That our work is not a necessary evil to get by, but our work is meant to be something we do as worship to the Lord. And it doesn't matter what kind of work it is. It even could be a positive slave master scenario, or it could be a horrendous slave master scenario. And God would say, not difficult, I'm sure in injustice slave master scenarios, God wants to step in and bring justice. But in general, God's saying the attitude that should be in your heart, regardless of what the scenario is, is how can I work for this master as though I'm working unto the Lord. And that is a new way of living. And that is a new way of living that I would never be able to do relying solely on my own human power. The only way that I would have the capacity to do that is if I relied on the power that raised Christ from the dead. And the only way that I could get that power is if I truly walk in the freedom that Christ gave me when he gave his life for me. And how did he do that? By coming as a child in a manger, letting the very people that would raise him also let them kill him so he could beat death for each one of us and give us a new way to be living today. So my encouragement to you, church, is as you finish up this New Testament, I've run out of time, do your best to, yes, read through in the closing bits of these short letters, but take time to pause and realize the implications of the things that Paul's saying. Because you might find in your life, in your reading, in the closing of this year, God might, wanting, might be wanting to speak to you some eternal truths that mark your hearts that you'll carry with you as I've carried these four verses with me in my 20 years of ministry. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we have a new life to live that we do in freedom to you and empowered by you. I thank you, Lord, that you are concerned with the gravity of our freedom. You are concerned with the gravity of our salvation, but you're also concerned by the gravity of showing up in the workplace. That, Lord, you don't provide a belief system that's meant to keep us in the clouds. You provide a belief system that's also meant to get us down in the dirt and be dirty. Father, I pray as we close this year that we would realize that the gifts you have for us are truly gifts with no strings attached. And that we have a new life that we get to walk in you. But the moment we put on yokes of doing, the moment we put on lists and guidelines, we begin to step out of that freedom. But it's only because we've done it to ourselves. Lord, may we throw that yoke of slavery off. May we truly walk in the freedom that you've given us. May we truly walk a new life empowered by your spirit that raised Christ from the dead a life that was born in a manger that we're celebrating today, yet chose to give its life for us so that, Father, we could even see our work turn into worship to you. Thank you, Father, for the gift you've given us in this season. May we enjoy all the parties and all the gift giving and gift receiving, but may this never look over the deeper meaning behind all of it, that we receive the greatest gift ever given, and that gift continues to give to us each and every day. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.